next to uh, an interview with Sandra White. And I'm going to hand you over to an agenda committee colleague of mine, Judith Husband, who's been in conversation with Sandra, and I'll let Judith uh, take over from there. So are we ready to go with that? I'm delighted to introduce Sandra White to LDC conference this year. Sandra is National Lead for Dental Public Health in Public Health England. She qualified from Manchester and has worked in all clinical spheres from MaxFax, general practice and the community dental service. She became a consultant in dental public health, taking up her first role in Buckinghamshire LDC where I was working locally as a dentist at the time. She's always supported our professional networks within dentistry, both BDA, branch and section. She was president of the National Association of Prison Dentistry UK when I was working in prison as well. And she's been deeply involved with the British Association of Community Dentistry. She's never shied away from the difficult areas of dental public health and the crossover with politics, championing, championing fluoridation, and other areas within dentistry. I am delighted to introduce her today and I will hand over to Sandra to give a little bit more detail as to exactly what her role involves because we do understand that there is confusion, there is overlap as well in some respects um, within all of these different, different government organisations. So Sandra, if you could give us an update and an outline of, of your role today. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a lovely introduction, Judith. Um, and uh, I have a fantastic team. I'm really blessed in having a fantastic team in Public Health England. Um, and we have some responsibilities. So we have the responsibility for epidemiology for England. So we lead on the survey so that when you have the, you know, the so many percent of five-year-olds have decay, they're the kind of things that we lead and coordinate across England. So that's epidemiology oh. and intelligence around GA figures um, for extractions and things like that, um, pharmaceuticals around how many prescriptions there are. We also lead on um, and deliver the Secretary of State's responsibilities for water fluoridation. So ensure that the areas that are fluoridated Dated, um, actually receive it and that we, we keep we try and um, make sure that the water companies are kept to account and we're doing that um, and obviously you know safe and effective water fluoridation I'm going to get my plug in here we're hoping that that will expand and luckily at the moment there is a good political will for that so that's really good so we also have a system leadership role around oral health improvement and inequalities and so we'll have we have the child oral health improvement program board that leads on children um, and works system-wide so it's not we nobody can do anything alone we work with all all the other organizations department for health department for education nhs office of cdo all of the different organizations to work together to try and improve child oral health and reduce inequalities and similar sort of we're just starting with the adults we hit children first but starting with the adults so that we can do that too um, and we also and this is important at this time have a health protection role um, and public health england a lot of people within public health england came from the health protection so you know the, the societies that were there at the time so they've morphed into phe and we're part of public health england so that's what my team does within public health england and we relate to the other organisations. So we have close working relationships with uh, Department of Health and Social Security. And I'm on the, so the contract uh, reform board, for example, um, and also work with Office of CDO and Sarah and Eric and Carol to, you know, to try and coordinate what we're doing and Health Education England at a national level. So um, we, you know, we try and my focus is on oral health improvement and inequalities um, and intelligence. And that's what we do within Public Health England. And that's what my team does. And it's a very good team. Now, Public Health England really has hit the headlines during this pandemic. Um, it's an organisation that perhaps wasn't that well known outside medicine and dentistry. And now it's constantly in the headlines on our social media feed. Now, one of the concerns within the dental profession is always, is our voice being heard? Mm. Um, now, <laughs> we, we, we know that dentistry might seem a small part uh, within healthcare normally, but the concern now has been, have, have we been sidelined? Are we being listened to? And how is our voice and our needs being escalated within the, the, the various structures that have emerged? Yes. And I think that's common whether you're local or national. 
So I think LDCs would recognise that locally, you know, if they're trying to work with their local authorities or within their local NHS system, that, you know, we all, and I do it too, it's like, and dentistry, and dentistry, you, you're constantly having to remind people about dentistry and, and that although we want to be within the healthcare system, we do have some peculiarities that, that make us different. And so at a national level, we're, we, we are working, we have um, Public Health England in terms of the guidance works with the four UK uh, countries um, and we're helping to develop guidance. So we, some of the members of my team and myself have sat in the guide, what they call the guidance cells. So it all sounds really horrible because it's a cell, but there are different guidance cells within Public Health England. So there's, there might be the epidemiology ones, which are bringing together the figures that you see on the news each night, you know, how many people have had have died of COVID sadly, or how many people, you know, the, 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 the R numbers. So there's the epidemiology cell, there is a, a virology cell around testing and, and how, that, how that's working. And then there are clinical guidance cells and external guidance cells that are looking to develop guidance on everything from how you deal with dead bodies to what the bin men do to what about mass gatherings about should we wear masks or not. So we and we do sit and help to contribute within that within that generic post. And our role within my team really is to try and pull out of the guidance that's there that covers the whole of health and social care, what's relevant to dentistry and how that and how that will impact on us. Um, and so there are some obvious things where we're very different. So we're very close to the patients. We do a lot of AGPs, aerosol generating procedures. So it's to try and keep doing that. Yeah, and dentistry. And what, what about that's different for dentistry? So we're trying to champion that. And people are very kindly sent in information and, and evidence. And we try and feed that through as well to the cells so that they know what's going on and we, and we can try and disseminate it back. And we have a network of consultants in dental public health across Public Health England, local consultants in dental public health. And we have weekly meetings with them and we also send them information for them to distribute locally too. So we're trying, so when things like the fit testing was starting and if we find out any other information about air conditioning or whatever, we try and disseminate it out that way. And obviously we work with Office of CDO. Yeah. And as practitioners, you, you mentioned gathering information. It feels like we've just had a plethora of surveys, yes. whether it's BDA, whether it's Public Health England, NHS England. Um, in, are these things actually being used? The surveys. Well, we've yeah. every, well, I'm sure they are. So that we've I've received information in from different organisations that have talked about this is what our survey found, select surveys, and it's it all adds to the evidence. This is a novel virus. We've never dealt with this before, and we're using the information from um, previous uh, coronavirus, so SARS one, and also the interpandemic er areas. We're using that as sort of evidence, but all of these things build that evidence. It's evolving, and and, cha and guidance changes because of it. You know, we, we I, I'm sure people know that we're all going to be wearing masks in shops. You know, it's a change that things are changing as the more evidence comes in. So um, I, I'm sure that, the, that all of the people that are doing surveys are using them because there's no point doing them otherwise. We did a, a, a survey, feedback survey about what, you know, what went well, what didn't go so well, what could we do differently? Um, and we haven't published that yet and we don't know how we're going to do that. It's, 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 um, we'll have to think carefully about how we do that. But obviously what, what it brought out was, was emotion really. Um, people are very upset or angry or worried or and and actually that's understandable we're in a global pandemic this is not normal times if you feel normal in a global pandemic there's something wrong with you <laughs> you know mm. we will feel all of those horrible emotions and and actually it's actually sometimes difficult to even admit it to yourself because you, you're built to be strong aren't you and you know carry on but actually it is it's a really emotional time so it brought out some of that and it brought out some other key themes that you would you would expect you know how do we communicate effectively national local nationally how do we do that how how do we make sure that patients get the care that they didn't need um, all of the guidance which guidance do we use how's the guidance developed ppe too much too little so that these are the sort of themes that came out and we're, we're using those to try and think okay how could we do things better next time how, how could we use that and think okay so perhaps we need a system and, and even locally you know where we've just had leicester in sort of lockdown how locally 
are people um, formed? Because it's not just the NHS, we have private dentists too, and they have a valuable contribution to the healthcare system. How do we communicate them with them? So um, yes, I think there's a lot of learning and I think, and I think that'll, be, that'll be very positive. I think we won't go, ever go back to normal and in some ways that will be a good thing. I think you're, you're touching on a question now. We did call for questions uh, for, for all the speakers at conference. And we had Martin Longbottom uh, from West Pennine LDC asking precisely that question. And I think it, it's something that we've all, we've all wondered is, you know, when will we get back to normal? Yes. Will, will there be a normal? Uh, are we going to have to wait for a vaccine? Yes. Um, so do you have any insights or opinions on that? So Martin, I am polishing my little crystal ball as we <laughs> no, <laughs> I do think that we'll never get back to normal. It will never be normal like we knew it before. Um, only smallpox has been eradicated in the global situation. It's unlikely that we will totally eradicate COVID-19. Um, but things will get back to more that we to a, to a state where we recognize you know that we will get we won't always be in respirators we won't always be having an hour's downtime things will improve we are still in a situation called sustained community transmission which means that we have to treat everybody like they've got it at the moment so we've got to treat you know whether they've got symptoms or not we will get to a stage when the prevalence is much lower that the r number is low that we can actually start to ask people do they have any symptoms are they uh, are they isolating in any way and we'll be able to treat them like we would have treated people before all this started so there is hope you know we will get back to that but there might be some things that change you know we, we might have to be putting extractor fans in windowless rooms there might be all sorts of things that we do differently hopefully people's hand and respiratory hygiene will always be better you know how many where did all that soap go on the supermarket shelves you know it will be a good thing that people know that they should be washing their hands and that they should be you know catching their their sneezes or doing the, whatever that is, <laughs> I don't know what it is. You, you you touched on uh, on the hot topic at the moment the uh, the agps yes. and the fallow time yes um you also made reference to the various cells and how information is brought together yes one of the concerns is always that we we are having legislation foisted or advice foisted on us that is not rele relevant to dentistry mm. so um how you know how are we going to move moving forward and also globally of course because this is not just happening in the uk dentists around the world are all doing very different things they are they are and there is, and, it, and it's very difficult and i i do feel I feel for the dentists because they'll think, well, what science is this based on? You know, I'm doing this. It's really affecting my business. You know, I might actually go out of business. And what's, you know, why are we doing it? So the first thing, why are we doing it is to keep the public safe and to keep our workforce safe. That's the, the, the mo most important thing. So we have to keep people safe. So when we don't know all about everything about the, the virus we have to be quite precautionary in, in what we're advi advising there is a lot of work carried on uh, carrying on at the moment around specifically around dentistry and agp so sdcep in scotland are looking at you know defining it and looking at mitigating factors um, there is a, a working group uh, with all sorts of um, experts within the working group so this isn't just you know what you don't do my team doesn't sit in a darkened room and make guidance we ha you use the um, all of the expertise from ventilation experts virologists engineering experts all sorts of different people to come up with what they think is the best way forward because obviously as dentists we're not infection control prevention experts we're not microbiologists there are a few there are a few in the associated clinical oral my microbiologists but there's not we're not that's by by nature so it's about getting those people together to get a really good um robust what you know advice and we're trying to look at the same time as that's all going on that and there's research going on across lots of different academic units are, are researching into agps as well so as long as that's going on we're also looking at how we can look to it might be more complex for the practices to start thinking about how number, the numbers of air changes in their rooms but how can we help practices to work those sorts of things out so that we could um, safely look to how we would reduce downtime you know if if we had more air changes if we had rubber dam and and um, high-speed suction how, how could we so we're doing that at the same time but it's difficult because it's a novel virus and so looking at the evidence is 
there isn't any evidence really on, on, on specifically some parts of that. There is some evidence about aerosols and there's evidence within dentistry, but not about some of the things that we want. So there is some research going on at the same time. Sorry, that's a very long answer for a, sh a short question. <laughs> so, so to date, we've been working on a precautionary principle to keep everybody safe, but you do foresee as we move forward opportunities to start to implement mitigating factors um, bear in mind each practice will be different i assume yes well all of the practices so there's a big difference isn't there between a windowless room and a big airy practice that's got ex, you know extractors uh, you know keyed in and big windows so there are differences so we're looking to see how we can do that but but the, the, you know, it, it is a difficult one and, and we do have to, we will always be precautionary, but we'll be, try and be precautionary that, and pragmatic. Yeah, yes, that's, that's reasonableness. Pragmatic. Yeah, it's reasonable. Yeah. And this is guidance, you know, this is guidance. We, and we had a lot of, we, when we did the London LDC, there were things about, oh, what if you take an x-ray? Can you step outside the room or inside the room? And, you know, we can give guidance. And this is what we think you need to, you need to stay in the room when you're doing an AGP. Obviously, if there's a medical emergency, you're not going to block the door to the ambulance and say, well, you can't come in because we've got a downtime of an hour. You know, there is something about using your clinical guidance and if, if your clinical um, decision making and then making sure that you if you do anything different then just make a note on it so that, you know, you've, you've got some notes about why you did something differently. I think that that's been one of the challenges really we, with the guidance coming out there's also been huge amount of interpretation um, and so there has been a need for clinicians as individuals and also within practices to actually implement that guidance and I think that has been a challenge yes. um, but moving forward it, it's also enabled us to be professionals in, in my view yes. um, you touched on the issue that we had with Leicester recently, and of course that's just up the road from, from me and, and you as well. Yes, yes. Um, we, we foresee that local lockdowns and changes throughout the pandemic are, are very likely. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to look at, are, are there any possibilities, any roles specifically for LDCs um, and how we can support practices within our specific areas get up to the minute information as well uh, and moving forward sort of learn the lessons as such because yeah. i know it hasn't been an easy an easy ride up yeah. in leicestershire yes so anything that you can do about communication that's really key you know how how is the how are the communication channels for example with private dentists so the nhs might have their own ways but how do the private dentists get keyed in and this is a public health issue and public health affects both NHS and private. There isn't any difference there. It's the same as bloodborne viruses. It doesn't matter whether you're a private dentist or an NHS dentist, you know, the same rules apply. So there is something about ensuring that there's good communication links and, and really seeking them out and, and forming them if they're, if they're not there at the moment. There's making sure that there's really good links with um, the LPN and the local consultant in dental public health because the consultant in dental public health will have links to the local health protection team. So ensuring that those all of those links and networks are really well established and and trust is built because it's all right saying oh yeah, I've got a communication list that's fine, but you need to work with people. Um, to build the trust so that you you know so that you believe what they're saying as well you know so if somebody asks you to do something you think what so so i think there's something there about building relationships locally i think it would be really useful ldc's have got a, a a fabulous role in terms of helping people to understand what the guidance comes out to being a source of 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 expert advice they're normally um more experienced practitioners and so they can help those that are, are struggling um and also the whole the whole health and well-being i think is really important you know I, I touched on it earlier that people don't like to admit when they're struggling even to themselves and actually to really touch base with people and check that people are okay you know and i remember talking to somebody once and she said they didn't ask me if i was okay at all and i said well did you tell them that you weren't okay and she said no and i thought mm, yeah well it's two ways but but there is something about checking in and having some buddy systems at this time when people are really upset and worried and worried about their jobs and worried about their health and their families and everything else so i think it was a health and well-being and ros from the bda would you know 
give me a pat on the back for saying that. She's, <laughs> <laughs> she's really, you know, she's, they're trying to do something at the BBA about that as well. So, you know, it's a really important aspect of all of this. Is, is, is that, you know, healthy? I think it's fair to say that the last few months really have have shown the best and the worst of, of yeah. people and we've all been under our varying stresses our journey throughout that time as well yes. um, and so to, to look out for each other in, in practice as well as uh, yeah. in our broader networks mm. I'd like to thank you uh, thank you Sandra for your time and for your openness as well I can only imagine what an incredibly difficult time and challenging time the last few months have been for you and to, to have an insight into how things work but also your motivations as well in, in keeping teams and practices safe um, is very reassuring to know. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. Thank you.